Hi, this is Courtney with Texas Teacher Today with free course subjects, EC through six tutoring. So tonight I'm going to do math because I haven't done math in a little while and most people want help with math. So I'll get started. Uh, I always like to start by showing you some data. If you Google EPP passing rates, this document will come up and this is by TEA. And this is the data on the first attempt, people that take their test. So if we go to course subjects, EC through six, math, and look at 902, because that's the current version, 802 was the old version, um, you can see 77% of first time takers pass the test. So it's not terrible. There's definitely tests that have lower passing rates, but it's not as high as some of them. So it's important to study. Um, another thing you should do is go to Google and type in Texas NES INC manual. This is the same website where you go to register for your test and to get your scores, but scroll down, click on four subjects, EC through six, click on go, and then you can look at each section for questions. You can also look at all of the competencies, right? So this is a really good, what I call a starting guide. It's not really a preparation manual like they call it because for example, let's look at math overview and exam framework. So if we scroll down, I'll show you what I mean. And you were to only use this to study. I'll show you why you wouldn't probably be able to pass. Um, plans appropriate instructional activities for all students by applying research-based theories and principles of learning mathematics. But it doesn't tell you what those theories are or what the principles are. So see how this is very vague, right? And same thing like whenever we get down to selects appropriate representations of real numbers, fractions, decimals, percents for particular situations, but it doesn't tell you anything about that, no detail. So it's really just a starting point. It's not really enough for most people to pass the test. So you definitely need like a good study guide or a book to pass. Um, definitely look at all of the sample questions in here because they're super similar to the questions on the real test. And the ones in my course are super similar too, but I don't think anything gets better than, than the questions in here as far as being super similar to the real test. Um, so now let's do, and um, there's six competencies in math, right? But because this is free tutoring and I have another tutoring session right after this, I have to keep it kind of brief. So we're gonna do competency one, but I think you're gonna like that because competency one is all about instruction and assessment. So we actually, for a sixth of the test, we actually don't even have to know math, which is pretty cool if you don't like math, right? Um, so you can see um, it, remember it says, plan instructional activities that are appropriate for all students by applying knowledge of research-based theories and principles of learning mathematics. But let's see what these are. Uh, Studies show that appropriate classroom management, collaborative learning, motivation, and effective teaching strategies improve the results of math scores for students. This comes as no surprise since these are traits of a learner centered classroom. Classroom management is key. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if, if your students are not engaged and on task, learning cannot occur, right? So you might know more math than anybody else, but you won't be able to communicate it if you don't have classroom control right? Collaborative learning. We want to give students chances to work together. This is based on Lev Vygotsky's ideas of social and collaborative learning. Students are like, more likely to be interested and engaged if they're allowed to work with a partner or small group and they can learn together and explain concepts differently than the teacher would. Research shows that collaborative learning has a positive effect on learning math. And then motivation. Students who are motivated to learn will almost always perform better since they put effort into learning the material and will do their assignments, right? So that's pretty um, straightforward. Effective teaching strategies. Everything should be learner-centered, focused on the needs of the students. So not with the teacher lecturing for a long time, not lots of worksheets. Definitely use differentiated instruction where you take into mind that everybody has different interests, backgrounds, readiness levels, um, things like that. So it's meeting the individual needs of your students. There's three learning styles, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and you're gonna meet the needs of all of those learners. We already talked about collaborative learning. Whenever you're teaching math or reading, 
Um, if you're doing collaborative learning, then you would do heterogeneous grouping, where you just group them different, different levels, different interests, different everything, right? But if we're doing small group targeted instruction and we need to work on specific skills, well, then we do group, group them homogeneously by ability level. We don't advertise it that these are the advanced students, these are the average, and these are the struggling. We don't do that. But we assess them and we group them. And then we can help the kids that are ready for multiplication on multiplication, the kids that are still working on addition, on addition, right? So that way we can help them on what they need. We still have to do the TEKS, absolutely, but we have to make it appropriate for them. And use non-linguistic representations like charts, pictures, graphs, etc. Sing songs, make rhymes, chants, use manipulatives. Teach students metacognitive strategies. This is thinking about their own thinking, self-evaluation. So when you're working out a word problem, you can read the question and pause and say, hmm, I didn't understand what the question is asking. I'm going to go back and reread that. Help students make goals and provide feedback and assign meaningful homework and classwork. So not just busy work. Instruction should always be learner-centered. I know I already said that, but they repeat it in the manual, so I repeat it again, too, that everything should be focused on the students. If you have even one English language learner in your class, you need to implement the ELPS. So if you have my course, it's hyperlinked. If you don't, just Google ELPS, E-L-P-S, English Language Proficiency Standards, and read over those and know what's, what's expected at each grade uh, proficiency level. Piaget stages of cognitive development. This comes up on the core subjects test. It comes up on the STR. It comes up on the PPR. So don't forget this stuff. This is important. At the sensory motor stage, the birth to two years, um, they're putting everything in their mouth and they're learning from their senses, right? They learn from movement and their senses. They only understand things from their perspective. And then the pre-operation stage, usually two to seven years old, they're egocentric. They only understand things from their point of view, but they are slowly starting to decenter to understand they're not the center of everything, right? They believe in animism, symbolism, and moral realism. So animism means they think that everything has the traits of living beings. So if they break a toy, they might think they hurt it. Symbolism, that something's a symbol of something else and moral realism that everybody has the same moral code as them. Concrete operation stage, usually seven to 11 years. Uh, they're starting to think in more rational terms, operational thinking. They start to understand conservation. So notice the con and conservation and the con and concrete, they go together, right? So conservation is the idea that something could look different, but be the same. So Maybe a tall, skinny glass of eight ounces of water is really not any different than an eight ounce wide glass of water, right? It still holds eight ounces. Now we have the formal operation stage, usually 11 to 12 years to 16 years old. Um, then they can think abstractly and engage in hypothetic deductive reasoning where they can come up with a hypothesis and think of possible outcomes. So they can think abstractly. So if we're asking students under 11 years old to think abstractly, that's not developmentally appropriate. And a lot of 11 year olds still can't do it. They're, they still haven't reached that stage. So we wanna be aware of that when we plan our lessons. All right, use technology. Your district will probably have websites that they prefer for you to use or systems, but you can use Starfall, BrainPop, um, use manipulatives like fraction strips and fraction wheels. Instructional grouping, we already talked about this. When you're doing small group instruction, it's homogeneous. All right, use various tools um, to improve mathematical understanding. So standard units of measure are feet, inches, meters, centimeters, et cetera, and they would use rulers and measuring tapes for that. But we also teach non-standard units of measure, especially in the lower grades, where they use paper clips, pencils, or blocks to measure how long something is. Right? When they're learning about angles, we use protractors to teach them how to measure an angle. Uh, for estimating, we use different containers, fill them with balls or candy and guess how many balls are in there, and then play money to teach them about bills and coins. Um, everything we do needs to tie into the TEKS, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. If you Google that, that will come up. The good news is if you teach at a public school in Texas, 
the curriculum has to be aligned to the TEKS. So it will be it will be aligned to the TEKS. You won't have to make sure of that. Uh, we've already talked about most of these things. Large group instruction, you want to start with that where you address the whole class and then you break them to small groups for targeted instruction. Tutoring might be required sometimes. So that's one-on-one -on -one help, um, usually before or after school, but sometimes you can tutor a student individually while the rest of the class works on an assignment. Um, use Bloom's taxonomy. This is the levels of questioning. Definitely Google this if you haven't learned about this in your EPP and your preparation program, but these are the levels. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, create. We want to ask all levels of questions, but especially these higher level questionings that re require critical thinking. So worksheets can be helpful for some practice, but we want to include lots of other things, not just worksheets. Each day post the TEKS on the board that your lesson will address. Use a variety of assessments. So informal assessments might be like a show what you know, an exit ticket, just a simple question and answer. It doesn't make students nervous. A formal assessment is a quiz or a test that does make students nervous. So we want to use both because sometimes students get so nervous that they don't perform well and it doesn't show what they actually know. Formative assessments are given while you're still teaching a unit and then you're planning further instruction. So you're forming your further instruction and they're forming their knowledge. It's a formative assessment. A summative assessment is given at the end of a unit when everything is summed up. So that helps me remember the difference between those. We always wanna use interdisciplinary units as much as possible. This is where we connect different subjects, math, science, social studies, language arts, and have a thematic unit where there's a theme. So an example of an interdisciplinary thematic unit would be um, when my daughter was in first grade, they did a unit on Johnny Appleseed. So they read, the theme was apples, right? And it was interdisciplinary. And in social studies, they read about Johnny Appleseed. In language arts, they wrote a reflection. In art, they drew a picture. In math, they uh, cut up apples. Well, the, the adults did that. The parent volunteers came in and they followed a recipe to make applesauce and then they got to eat it. So see how there was a theme and it was interdisciplinary. It was connecting different subjects. So they were, they were following steps in a recipe and measuring. So it was tying in math too. Uh, metacognition is thinking about your own thinking or self-evaluation. We want to show students how to do that by modeling our thinking. We already talked about the different types of assessments. If they repeat it in the manual, I repeat it, but I don't think we need to go over that again. Um, like I said, you have to implement the ELPS if you have even one English language learner. If you have a special education or 504 student, you need to follow their IEP. Um, there's also a norm reference test and criterion reference test. So a norm reference test shows how a student performs relative to his or her peers. So it'll give a percentile, like they're in the 50th percentile or the 90th percentile. So if they're in the 90th percentile, they did better than 90% of other people their age. If it's criterion reference, it assesses their knowledge of certain skills and criteria. So like the STAR test is criterion reference. It's not really comparing somebody to their peers. It's saying, do they know the skills and knowledge for that grade level? And then we want to teach students how math is used in the workplace. We can do that by inviting guest speakers to talk about how they use math. So a stay-at-home parent could talk about how they budget, right? Pharmaceutical company and technological companies can talk about how they use math in developing their products. So there's lots of ways math is used in everyday um, let's look at a couple of questions. I'm going to skip this one because it's so long that I'm just going to get it wrong and we'll do one that's a little bit shorter so, so you guys can see it. Ms. Gonzalez teaches kindergarten. She breaks her class up into pairs and gives each pair of students a small toy and several paper clips. Then she asks them to measure how long the toy is by using the paper clips, how many paper clips they need to use to line up um, to be as long as the toy. What is Ms. Gonzalez teaching? Standard units of measure, estimation, non-student units of measure, standard units of measure, preliminary skills required to learn before using a ruler. So there might be more than one answer that seems right, but you've got to pick the best answer, right?
So this one, I don't think anybody's answered yet. Do you guys have an answer? This one would be non-standard units of measure because they're using the paper clips to measure. So it is a preliminary skill, but it's not necessarily required to use a ruler, right? They don't have to do that first. It helps, but it doesn't have to be that way. A third grade teacher is teaching a unit on fractions. At the beginning of class, she gives students a few minutes to do a couple of warm-up problems involving fractions in their math journal. She then collects the math journals and reviews them to determine how many students understand what they have been studying. What type of assessment is this? Formal, formative, summative, or standardized? So I'll show you what happens when we pick formal. It's not formal, it is uh, formative because she's still teaching, that's okay. She's still teaching the unit and it's not really, it doesn't sound like it's high pressure. It's just a journal entry, right? Um, and she's still teaching the unit, it says. And then she's determining what they understand. So it sounds like she's gonna use that for further instruction, right? So you can see if you get it wrong, it's no big deal. It'll tell you why the answer is correct and why the other answers are incorrect. Um, well, I have to get ready for my next tutoring session, but I left some time for questions. Do you guys have questions? No, and I know you might already have a study guide that works for you, and if you do, that's great. But if you need um, something, or if you like the way mine works, and the actual math part I explained really clearly in an in, in easy way, you can enroll in mine and try it out. Um, and there's even a coupon code that I put in there that you can save 10% with the code 10%. Uh, you can enroll in, in all subjects or just an individual subject if you just need one subject. Uh, but any other questions or comments or anything? Oh, and uh, yeah, you can email me your question. Also, you guys can call or text me at 361-846-0741. Again, that's 361-846-0741. And the iPhone user, if you'll put in the chat box your, um, your name, I'm gonna email y'all something special, the people that came. So I'm gonna email everybody that, that enrolled in the class, but not everybody came. Some people came, like signed up and didn't come. So if you'll tell me what your name is, if you if you want to get the special thing that I'm going to email, then tell me your name in the chat box. All right. Well, I've got to run and get ready for my next session. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Guadalupe. So, uh, so we'll email you something. My social media manager will email y'all something either tonight or to, probably tomorrow because I think he's off work for the night. Uh, but thank you so much for for coming, and I hope y'all have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Bye.